Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, this is going to be the second part of our measurement theory uh, series of lectures. And in here, we're going to briefly review the components of measurements. So pretty much how do we go out and get some sort of observed data and in an effort to get it as close to the true score of the concept we're trying to measure as possible. Um, so in order to break that down, we're going to go a little bit deeper into factors impacting bias and talk about two things called response styles and response sets, which can influence the amount of bias, which is a type of error. Um, we're also going to talk about reliability. Um, and as we mentioned in the previous lecture, reliability, the idea of it is, is to see consistency in our measurement. So how do we measure it when we're conducting research and how can we improve it? What are the problems associated with having low reliability? So we'll go through that and we'll wrap up with talking about if we find that we have low reliability in our study, how do we improve the level of reliability? The readings associated with this particular lecture are continue, continuing chapter five from your course textbook and chapter six from your course textbook, although it's not listed in the syllabus as a required reading, I would encourage it as an optional reading because they go into some detail about scrutinizing various types of surveys and how we use uh, and collect data using survey research, which I think will be beneficial for this class as well as the main writing assignments for this class. Um, the other two things I encourage you to take a look at are two handouts that I posted on Beachboard recently. And these are examples of a short um, survey-based approach for measuring criminal thinking. So criminal thinking has been a construct or an idea in, in the theory of criminology or various theories of criminology uh, for several decades now. But Texas Christian University created these criminal thinking scales um, as a short, quick way to measure individuals' levels of criminal thinking. Um, and within then, you'll see they measure things like cold-heartedness, entitlement, uh, justification, your power orientation, all very abstract concepts and constructs um, that researchers have, believe might have some sort of connection to your propensity towards committing crime. And by looking at the actual survey itself, as well as their scoring guide, you can get an idea of some of the things we've been talking about, whether it be operationalization. Um, you can also think about the idea, one of the things we're going to talk about in a moment is reverse wording of how we ask questions. And then think about how that may help us to better understand uh, data collection in the realm of criminal justice research. So let's go ahead and get started. So as a sort of recap of what we saw in our last lecture, when we think about going out and collecting data from the larger world, we have to think about, well, what are we exactly are we collecting and what are we trying to measure? We're trying to capture some true score out there but we can never be 100% certain, no matter how we measure our data, that we're getting the 100% true score for some abstract construct. So if I'm measuring somebody's level of cold heartedness, how do I go about doing that? If I'm trying to measure somebody's level of empathy, how do I do that? If I'm trying to measure somebody's level of um, intoxication, how do I measure that? So we have different ways to do that. And as researchers, we go out and we get that observed score. Remember that observed score, that's the X. So whether I ask a series of questions in a survey in order to get an idea of your level of empathy or your level of cold heartedness, um, or whether or not I take a, a blood test in order to measure somebody's level of intoxication, um, whatever I do, whatever method I use to get my observed score, I have to always understand that I'm not going to be 100% accurate. And so I've got to figure out, well, if I'm not always going to be 100% accurate, where does the error come in? Where do those things that make the, the observed score different from the true score? What are the causes for that? And there are three major areas. There's that ER in this um, hypothetical equation of random error. And as I mentioned in the previous lecture, that relates to reliability. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. The second source of error is bias. 
and bias, we're going to talk just a little bit about some of the sources that may contribute to bias also in this lecture. And then finally, we have that non-random error, which is represented by the W in this equation. And this is from when you're measuring the wrong construct. And this relates to validity or the accuracy of what you're shooting for, or what you're trying to measure. We will talk about that more in the following, the follow-up lecture. So a measurement theory part three. So let's go ahead and dive into talking about bias. And then we will talk about uh, reliability and its relationship to that random error component. Let's go ahead and move on. All right, so bias tends to be, most of us, if I say, oh, somebody was biased towards this or biased in that way or that way, um, we typically have a general understanding of that. Um, but in the realm of research, we have to find a way to sort of quantify the idea of bias, right? Almost all, to operationalize it. And two sort of key terms or concepts that we use to understand how bias may be introduced into data collection within the uh, uh, within research methods are two things called response styles and response sets so let's take a quick look at both of these and get an idea of what they mean and how they may lead somebody to the responses may be sort of swayed consistently in one direction that is not an actual accurate picture of what the individual's true feelings are so the first is response styles. So this is an individual's manner of responding regardless of the content of the question. And the way I like to think about it is we all have our style, right? Some of us are laid back. Some of us are more proper. Some of us like to dress in a hip fashion. Some of us like to be, you know, uh, flamboyant. Some of us like to be more downplayed. Most of us, and this is kind of my like sort of mnemonic way of, of remembering response style, your style is your style, right? I can have you, you know, change the way you dress or the way you speak or the music you listen to for a little bit, but over time, it's kind of sticks with you. It's who you are, right? A style is sort of a, I think, sort of a um, something that, that is pretty static and kind of sticks with you over time. Um, so why do I say it that way? Well, when we look at what a response style is, it's, it's that person's personality that we're capturing. So the second bullet point we see here, it says that a response style is a reflection of a subject's personality and not the construct being measured. And then I say yay saying, nay saying, extreme responses. What I mean by that is some of us tend to be sort of be the agreeable type. We're the yay sayers. Hey, did you like that movie? Sure. How was the, the food? It was fine, et cetera, et cetera, right? That you just tend to be agreeable. Then there are certain people that their personality, they tend to be the more pessimistic naysayers. You know, how did you like the movie? Oh, oh my goodness, the acting was horrible, the blah, 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 was bad, right? Um, how did you like the food? Well, oh, it was a little cold, these were overcooked, and just typically tend to have that sort of personality. And then you also have the extreme responders, the, oh my God, that was so great. It was like, so it's the greatest thing I've ever had. Or, oh, that was the worst thing ever. Okay. So what do I mean by that is think about your friends. Think about yourself. Think about your family. You know, with certain friends, you have the yaysayers, the ones like, hey, let's go hang out. And they're like, sure. Um, you have the naysayers. Hey, do you want to go to this concert? You want to go out and get some something to eat? I don't know. No, I don't feel like doing it. And then you have the, ex the extreme responders too, right? Um, this is, comes through even when we're conducting research. And this is what we call response style. Now, so why is this a problem in the realm of research? Well, oftentimes, especially when we're trying to do survey-based research or question-based research, where we're asking our subjects a research question or a particular item on a, on a survey, they will respond in one of these manners as opposed to giving good, concrete, objective response to it. So quick example of this is most of us are somewhat familiar with the idea of doing like a, a teaching evaluation or, a you know, reflections on teaching at the end of a semester, right? We do at, at Cal State Long Beach, we have the spot forms that we give out to students and you give feedback on the quality of the teaching of the professor. Some people, and I've seen it, I've been teaching a long time, 
Some people I can tell go through and scrutinize, read the question, think about the question, consider the question, and then give of an accurate response or an accurate response. That's a good thing. That's what we want in research. Other people, I believe, respond using a response style. There are certain people who go like, eh, I got a decent grade. I didn't hate the guy too much, and they become yaysayers. And no matter what the question is, they go, yep, yeah, good score, good score, good score, good score, right? Um, other people tend to be, oh, I remember that one day that he docked me for turning in my assignment two days late, and I will never forgive him for that. And they turn into the naysayers. So no matter what the content of the actual question is, they're going to respond in a negative fashion. Um, and then obviously you can understand the idea of the extreme responders, the people who don't go, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones or the fives on like a you know, five point scale. They're not thinking about, you know, how do I consider something in the middle? So all of these, this idea of a response style is very problematic in the realm of collecting data because we want people to actually scrutinize and seriously consider the questions as opposed to just going with whatever their general style of answering questions happens to be. So how do we protect against this? Well, the one way we can protect, protect against this with response style is what we call balanced item wording. Fancy terminology, but what it means is you don't write every single question in a survey in a manner where a yes response is a positive answer. You sometimes need to reverse word the style of the question. So rather than having every question say, the professor was good at teaching this course, a yes is a positive thing. The professor knew the material, a yes is a positive thing. You wanna throw in questions like, the professor did not seem prepared to handle the question or handle the course, where a yes is actually a negative thing. And so I encourage you to look at the examples that I posted with the criminal thinking scales examples, and you'll see some of the, the questions within there are what they call reverse worded, where a positive response isn't necessarily positive, it's actually going in the negative fashion. So it's all about how we sort of set up the, the question. Let's move on to the second factor that can impact bias. So the second factor are response sets. So if, if the style, the first one was sort of like, that's who you are, that's your personality, it doesn't really change, it's just, it sticks with you over time, then the response set is much more dynamic, meaning that it, you sort of, People tend to change depending upon the situation. And so you can imagine how this might work. So let's look at this first bullet point. A response set is an individual's tendency to respond in a manner consistent with a quote unquote preferred image. So you can imagine in certain social settings and social situations, some people will do what will change their behavior in order to do whatever they think is desirable in order to be liked. Um, and then also, in cer certain social situations, people will become defensive if all of a sudden things get a little bit too personal or sensitive for them to, to feel comfortable responding. So social desirability and defensive are two of the things that sort of set off these response sets about doing a preferred um, image. So for example, when we're talking about things that are very sensitive questions, things like their sexuality, um, their whether or not people are engaging in illegal behavior or other social taboos, sometimes people are not going to be completely honest. They may respond to the moment and go, well, I don't want to admit the illegal behavior I've engaged in because I don't know who else might hear about it and I don't think these people like that. Same idea with one of the things that's very, you know, um, contemporary and important at the moment is when we think about racial issues um, and racism. I mean, obviously, if I ask, if I put out a, a survey asking about people's opinion about individuals of various races or their, you know, in that sense, one of the things people may go, well, oh, I know, I'd, even if they true, truly deep down inside feel one way or another, they may say, go, okay, what's the politically correct way to respond to this? That's a problem for researchers. I don't want you to be politically correct. I don't want you to try to play up to be and be nice to me. 
if as a researcher we want the, the raw, honest truth when we ask questions from people. And it's hard to get people to always be 100% honest and straightforward and forthcoming when we ask them questions. Because even if they feel that it's, or even if we tell them that it's anonymous or confidential, there's a part of the human uh, brain that says, I, mm, I don't know about this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond in a way that sounds like what I think they want to hear as opposed to what I really feel. Um, and so there's certain ways we have to always keep that in mind when we're scrutinizing um, the data that we're collecting and in how we, how we uh, administer our surveys. So, but unfortunately, many statistical attempts to control for response sets will also diminish the validity of responses in general. So this is one of those things that I always tell people when you're conducting research, always be aware of the limitations, right? So one of the things is, is if something doesn't smell right, there may be something going on, is kind of the idea. So as a researcher, you do your best to ask people to be honest in their responses and tell them that there's gonna be no impact on their, what their responses are and hope that they are truthful, but keep an eye out for little hints and tendencies that make you think, I think this person's just responding to try to be nice, or maybe they're being a little defensive, or whatever it may be. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to talking about reliability. So reliability, you may recall, is the idea of being consistent. That's the term, if you just keep that in the back of your mind, Reliability and consistency in how we measure things are a key thing. Um, it tends to be related to that random error um, in that equation that we saw at the beginning of this lecture. And so we wanna reduce that random error as much as possible in order to be more reliable in our measurement. Well, the good thing about reliability is that it's very, we have a lot of statistical tools um, that help us to measure it. And so we can have a pretty clear cut objective idea of the reliability of any particular research strategy, whether it's a survey approach, a question, an interviewing approach, an observational approach, or some other strategy. So much so that we actually, there are quite a few, what we call in statistics, reliability coefficients. Um, so these various reliability coefficients, and we'll talk a little bit about this in our statistics course, or hopefully you heard about it a little bit when you took statistics. These are ways to measure the, the consistency or reliability of any particular measure. And we'll talk about a few of these in a, in a moment. Arguably, probably the most common one, especially in the field of criminal justice research and in survey research in particular, is known as Chromebox Alpha. Um, so most of these real reliability coefficients range from zero to one. So it's a a number. It's computed statistically. You enter in the data that you have collected from your subjects. The, the, a, a program like SPSS or some other uh, statistical software will run the reliability coefficient and you get a value and it says your survey has a reliability of 0.67, something like that, or 0.34 or 0.89, right? And you can see these typically range from zero to one. And then the higher the value, the closer the coefficient is to a value of one, that is indicative of higher reliability. Um, and depending upon what you're measuring, sometimes you're, you're looking for reliability coefficients that are 0 0.80 or higher. Other times, if you're with Chromebox Alpha, sometimes if you're looking at a scale, if it's 0.6 or 0.7 or higher, you're in pretty good shape, um, but that's, for another time in a more deeper discussion. For right now, the key thing I want you to understand is that we are able to objectively measure reliability using these statistical coefficients that range from zero to one with higher values, meaning more reliability. So what are the consequences of, of low reliability, right? Like what's the problem? Like what happens? Well, the, one of the things is we have this concept in research called attenuation. And attenuation means that the relationships between the constructs tend to be underestimated. So it, it weakens, attenuation means to weaken something, to weaken our estimate of the, the um, relationship or the correlation between various constructs, say our exogenous construct and our endogenous construct. They are 
the measures tend to be weaker than we actually thought. Why? Well, because maybe if you, reliability is about consistency. So if I'm not hitting what I want to, and sometimes I'm over measuring something, sometimes I'm under measuring something, you can imagine how that leads to a misleading outcome when we start to turn our research data and analyze it statistically. And we start to see this thing called attenuation. And then obviously, reliability does have an impact also on validity or accuracy. So it leads to any attempt to have a good estimate of the true score, which is what we're shooting for, tend to be poorer. So let's talk about various ways that we can measure reliability in research. And we're gonna cover four different ways. And I'm kind of just giving you an overview. We could spend an entire semester talking about these various ways of measuring reliability, but I'm gonna talk about four different approaches that are commonly used in criminal justice research. So when we think about the types of reliability measures we want to use or that are available to us, the choice depends on the type of measurement that we're actually using. Um, if we had more time and I, in a longer course, we could go into much more detail about multiple types of measurement approaches and methodologies. But as I've already stressed before, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time sort of looking at questionnaire and survey research, otherwise known as correlational research. Um, but we're also gonna to touch a little bit on things like observational research in this. So let's take a look at a couple of these things. So depending upon the type of measurement, that will dictate the best reliability measurement approach for you to use. So the first one, and probably one of the most common ones used um, as far as reliability, reliability work is known as internal consistency or within test consistency. So when do I use this? This is used, imagine if you have a survey that has multiple items on it, multiple items. So multiple items meaning like, you know, multiple questions. Um, so this could be an exam, a questionnaire, a survey. And usually it's done when you're doing what we would call a cross-sectional study when you're sort of administering this survey at one point in time. So once again, the good example of when we might use internal or, or when we might use internal consistency would be if we had used something like that TCU criminal thinking scales that I mentioned previously and that I have posted on Beachboard. Um, once again, a reason for why it's important for you to review it. In that criminal thinking scales, there are 36 questions. And those 36 questions are designed to measure six different constructs. So that doesn't mean there's only one question per construct. Oftentimes there's anywhere from like four to seven questions per construct. And in order for us to find, well, are we being reliable? What you do is you can assess the reliability using one of these statistical methods. So you see down there, we have what is known as split half reliability. So that's where you're looking at, you'll get one half of the questions for one topic compared to the second half of questions. So for example, let's say that I have a survey where I'm measuring somebody's level of cold heartedness. Are you a cold hearted person? And I've got eight different questions that I think all tap into this construct of cold heartedness. So I ask you these eight questions. Well, if my eight questions are reliable, you should be pretty consistent in how you reply. For those of you who are cold-hearted, your responses to all eight questions should reflect a cold-hearted person. If you are a warm-hearted or non-cold-hearted person, then your responses to all eight questions should reflect that warm hearted nature. If you're somewhere in the middle, then you should have a little bit of a mix to it. So you can imagine that's all we're doing. We're looking for consistency in how you're doing things. And so the split half reliability is one statistical approach and pretty much what it does, going back to my cold heartedness example, I would take four of the questions and find out what's your average response to these four questions and compare it to the other four cold-hearted questions and your average response to those. And then say, how close is that average? 
Then we have Kronbach's coefficient alpha, which I measured before, and arguably is one of the most important ones. I would keep that in the back of your mind because it is an important one that is used a lot when it comes to estimating and confirming reliability. And what coefficient alpha does is it just looks at all eight questions as an aggregate. And it says, how did you respond to question one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then it comes up with an overall average to say, how much do you, how different are you across your responses to those eight questions? And then it computes a reliability coefficient based upon that. Um, so the idea here is, for, especially for this class, is to not overthink it. It's just a cool, these are cool statistical ways to say, are we finding that people are consistent, right? I mean, if I'm a truly cold-hearted person, then I should be responding to those eight questions with cold-hearted responses. If I'm cold-hearted on two of them, I appear warm-hearted on another two, and then I'm in the middle somewhere else, that's not consistent. Bottom line, that's kind of the idea of what's going on here. It's just using statistics to measure it. So what happens if I find that I have a low reliability score, right? On the previous slide, we had talked about the idea that a reliability coefficient typically is scored from zero to one. So if I get come up with, you know, I run an analysis on my survey and a pilot test that I've done, and I realize that my Chromebox alpha is 0.4 or 0.3, that's pretty low. And so what I need to do is I need to go figure out, well, where are the problem? There's probably some problem questions. So maybe out of my eight questions, maybe six of them are showing a pattern of consistency, consistent responses. But maybe two of them are outliers. Well, guess what? Maybe I need to dump those two bad questions and put in better questions. Or I can always, because of the nature of reliability and how it relates to sort of um, random error that can be over or under, other uh, researchers will say, well, sometimes you're better off just adding more questions. If I want to measure somebody's level of cold heartedness, maybe I shouldn't just ask eight questions. Maybe I should ask 10 questions. Um, and then it, the overall findings will average out to a more consistent and accurate measure of that person's uh, true cold level of cold heartedness. So the idea here is the idea of trying to find and measure the consistency of individual responses. Um, to give you a, one other quick example, I told you to take time to look at the TCU criminal thinking scales. I think it gives you a good idea. Look through the basic questions. Like I said, for any one of those six um, constructs that are being measured in that, whether it be um, power orientation, entitlement, justification, etc. As you look through the questions that they have included, think to yourself, do these look like they're consistently tapping into the same thing, right? And the same thing we could do when we get to validity. But for right now, for reliability is if you respond to them, would you be kind of consistent in how you respond to those questions? Um, I know for a particular research project that myself and several of the colleagues at, at Long Beach did several years ago, well, we were um, analyzing a, a Senate bill, 1453, that was looking at uh, post-prison substance abuse treatment for offenders. When we designed a survey that was measuring their level of like sort of addiction or substance abuse, um, I ended up coming up with a scale simply measuring like substance abuse addiction and I ended up having somewhere between like 20 and 22 questions to try to get to that. Because in order to get a good reliability measurement, I needed to, you know, if you ask somebody, are you addicted to a particular substance? It's hard to get that a true story in one or two questions, right? Because it's not just how much do you use it? Um, do you go out of your way? How, you know, how often do you use it? Um, when was the last time you took a break from it? It's also, addiction also taps into questions about like, have you ever, you know, lost a job because you were high or drunk? Have you ever been hospitalized? Have you had health issues? Um, has this led to problems with your family? So you can imagine that as we get more complex in trying to measure these constructs, we start throwing in a lot of questions. And some questions in a survey that are trying to measure a particular construct, they may just be bad questions. So sometimes we have to dump them, get rid of them, or improve them. All right, 
Let's go ahead and move on to our second of the four reliability. All right, so now, once again, as I said, we want to think about when would I use this one? So this one's called test retest reliability. So this is also a reliability measurement approach that is used for multiple item measurements like questionnaires or surveys. But whereas the within test consistency or the internal consistency that we saw on the previous slide was used for surveys that are administered only once in a cross-sectional study, test retest tends to be more effective when you're doing something that is what is known as a longitudinal study where you can give the same survey to people on more than one occasion. So that's why I say here, for multiple item measurements used on multiple occasions. So the way it is played out in order to use this statistically and analyze the reliability, we would use the exact same measurement instrument. So the exact same questionnaire survey, and we give it to the same group of people on two separate occasions. So the example of this would be when I teach statistics, oftentimes I will give students on the first day of class a statistics test that has multiple choice questions and they do their best. It's not gonna impact their grade, but I say, just do your best. And then what they do is they give a response. And then at the end of the semester, I give them the exact same test. So it's kind of like a survey, right? Multiple choice, asking them various questions. And so what I do then is I look at the correlation between them. Now in that, in, in that instance, in my statistics class, I'm hoping to see an improvement because I have been teaching them statistics over the course of a semester. But if I wanted to think about it in a reliability fashion, if I gave them a statistics test, say on one day, and then 30 days later gave them the exact same statistics test without ever having taught them statistics, but just had them go about their daily life, I would expect their level of knowledge to be somewhat consistent, assuming I had put together a reliable measure. So oftentimes the way that this works is we're looking for, if we believe something to be static in your life, if we think that there's a personality trait, like are you cold hearted? Are, do you have a sense of entitlement? Um, do you score high on levels of empathy or, or low on levels of empathy or whatever it may be? Certain personality, personality characteristics, I would assume to be somewhat static. Static meaning that they don't really change over time. So this would be a good opportunity to try this test retest reliability where I give it to you on two occasions and then I simply check the correlation between your time one survey and your time two survey. If you responded rather consistently at time two, as you did with time one, then I can say we have pretty good test retest reliability. So that sort of makes sense. So a real quick recap, test retest, you get the exact same survey to people on two separate occasions. You then get a score for both of them. And if we see a, a strong correlation or association, AKA consistency in how they reply to those items of that survey or that questionnaire, then we can say we have good reliability. Now, if people change dramatically in how they've responded to the questions, then we go, uh-oh, that's low reliability. So this introduces us to two of the problems with the test retest reliability approach, right? So one of the thing is, and I'm gonna kind of go out of order here, but one of the problems is what we call maturation. So remember when I talked a few seconds ago about the, my statistics class? I would give them a statistics test on the first day of class, and then I would teach an entire semester of statistics, and then I would give them the same test at the end. So would I, would I get a good reliability score? Probably not. Why? Because they have matured. They have learned. And that's what the term in research methods, that term maturation means not just natural, physiological, or social maturation. It can be um, intellectual maturation or anything else, like just to mature over time. So in my statistics class, I would probably get a very poor test retest reliability score for my, my pre-post statistics course, but I would expect that. And the reason for it would be because of maturation. They have been taught something, they have learned 
over time. But it's not just when it comes to education. Um, sometimes if you if there's too long of a period between the um, sort of the app or the the use of your measurements, your questionnaire, your survey between time one and time two, then people just tend to naturally mature, especially if you're working with, say, young kids, right? If you give a, a group of five year olds some sort of questionnaire about how much they like their teacher and how well they get along with other kids in their class, then they may have one response at age five. And if you wait to one, even one year to age, age six, they have changed dramatically, right? So they've naturally matured. So that's one of the things we always have to be careful about that could give us a false negative reading about the reliability of a particular survey. The other problem with test retest is this concept called memory. And I think memory doesn't need a whole lot of explanation, but it just simply means if I gave you questions on say day one, if I called all of you into my office or into class and I said, hey, I want you to take this criminal thinking scale survey, 36 questions, measure six different constructs. Why don't you go ahead and fill it out and you hand it in. And then two weeks later, you come back into my office or classroom and I say, I'm going to give you this exact same criminal thinking scale survey. Now, don't you imagine that some people are going to remember how they responded to the questions originally? That's a problem, right? Because we're no longer truly measuring your criminal thinking. Rather, we're measuring you're going, oh, I remember things. And humans like to be consistent. Um, they like to be, you know, be consistent and go, how did I respond last time? Okay, I responded this way. I don't want to look like I'm, you know, weird or change or anything. So I'm going to try to re reply the exact same way. That is okay for humans, but it's not good for researchers because we're no longer targeting that construct of a particular type of criminal thinking, say cold heartedness, power orientation, etc. Rather, we're tapping into your memory. So that can be one of the drawbacks of using this test retest reliability. So how do we improve upon this method? There's another method that's out there. So let's move on to number three. So this is called parallel test reliability. So you would use it in the exact same way as test retest. You use it for surveys that are administered in a longitudinal fashion on multiple occasions in order to assess the reliability of that particular measurement instrument. So you, but the key difference between test retest and parallel test is that with parallel test, you're not using the exact same survey, rather you're using a similar survey. So you tweak the questions a little bit. You're still trying to measure cold heartedness or empathy or love of animals or whatever it is that you're trying to capture, whatever construct you're trying to capture, but you don't ask the exact same questions. You make them just a little bit different. And then once again, you can check the correlation between test one and test two or survey one and survey two in order to see whether or not you have high low, or low reliability. Now, the good thing is it's better than test retest but because you don't you no longer have that that memory issue but there's two potential drawbacks for parallel test one is you still can't stop maturation so whenever we're trying to assess the reliability of a particular instrument a particular questionnaire or survey instrument we always want to keep in mind that am i measuring a construct or constructs plural that are dynamic meaning that people may mature or change over time. Um, the good news is a lot of the things that we measure, um, people tend to be pretty stuck in who they are, especially if you're measuring adults. But sometimes people learn. Sometimes they're, they've become informed. Um, you know, sometimes if you're dealing with kids, they just, they change on a day-to-day -day basis. So that maturation can always be sort of a thorn in the side or a problem with you know, that the, the, the accuracy of your results of your reliability test, but it still makes it better than the test retest. The other drawback of parallel test is that when you, because you have to have slightly different questions that on each of your instruments, 
as we all can imagine, even changing the slightest little fact or detail within a question can actually change the entire sort of focus of the question. So a quick example, imagine this. Say I'm trying to measure somebody's level of, of uh, empathy or you know, sort of kindness to animals or some, I don't know, you give the construct a name of whatever you want. And I asked them something that details on the very first survey, one of the questions says, on a scale of one to five, please indicate how much you like being around dogs, right? So if somebody's a dog lover and on that scale of one to five and five means I like him a lot, one means I don't like him at all, a dog lover is going to be like, oh, four or five, right? So we're going, oh, this is a person who tends to like animals. Okay. So on my second survey, which I need to change that question, I can't ask, how much do you like dogs? So I go, okay, what would be something else? But that, would be, that would measure their level of love or kindness or appreciation for animals. And I go, oh, I'm just going to change it to cats, right? They're both domesticated creatures. Why not? And on the second one, I ask, how much do you like cats on a scale of one to five? I think you can probably figure out where I'm going with this. If somebody was a dog lover, but they're not a cat lover, even though I'm measuring sort of appreciation or respect or love for animals, I am now actually have changed the construct too, right? I've actually, because dogs and cats, there are people who love both. There are people who are dog people. There are people who are cat people and there are people who don't like either, right? And so that is that can be a problem with parallel tests. How do I get something that's different in asking a question, but still getting at the same idea? So that can be a really tough game to play. All right, let's, so each of these first three, whether it was the internal consistency, the test retest, or the parallel test reliability assessment approaches, all of these are primarily focused on when we're working with questionnaires or surveys. Well, what happens when we're doing observational research? So let's move on to our final type of reliability measure on the next slide. So this one, inter-rater reliability, is when we're no longer focusing on a methodology of using surveys or questionnaire-based research, but rather when we're doing observations um, as our measurement approach. So maybe I say, I want you to go out to you know a certain part of campus and i want you to count the number of times you see people being rude to one another right something very simple or i want you to go to a restaurant and observe social behaviors and i want you to measure whenever you find that people are being complimentary to one another like complimenting each other being nice paying attention to her or i want you to observe um kids playing in a classroom and I want you to measure what you think is the number of inappropriate responses or behaviors made by the children in the classroom, right? So I hire you as a research um, assistant, and I say, I want you to go out and observe the world. Well, even when we're observing, because what I think of as inappropriate behavior or good behavior or complimentary behavior or rude behavior, it's going to be different from each one of us, right? Some people think that as soon as somebody raises their voice and gets really animated with how they converse or talk with somebody else, that that's a sign of aggression. Not necessarily, right? Different cultures, different styles, different people, different personalities may perceive that differently. And so when, whenever we're doing observations of human behavior, we have to make sure that we can find out, well, how can I measure this consistently? Now, if I have only one researcher collecting all the data, then that researcher's point of view sort of dictates the consistency, right? They're going to kind of see the world through their eyes. But more often than not, when conducting research, you may have multiple researchers going out to different locations to measure different types of behavior. So, for example, let's say that I am going to send out a group of six different research assistants to various concerts, um, you know, around Southern California. And they're going to go out to a music concert. And I say, I want you to record um, the level of sort of inebriation and foolishness and drunkenness 
that you see at these you know, inappropriate inebriation, I guess I should say, not just like people being having a couple drinks and being a little buzzed, but people being like inappropriately drunk um, at one of these concerts. Well, depending upon this research assistant and where they go, each research assistant may have a slightly different opinion of how they subjectively interpret drunken foolishness or inappropriate behavior as they're observing the crowds and what they're seeing. Some people may see people who are kind of stumbling, slurring, spilling a drink a little bit. as like, ah, eh, that's fun. They're just having fun. Other people may look at that and go like, oh my goodness, if you're not completely acting proper and appropriate, I'm going to check that as inappropriate behavior. So hopefully you kind of get that idea of like how it changes from person to person, our subjective observations. But as me, as the head researcher, I still, once all these research assistants come back to me and give me their findings from concert A, concert B, concert C, concert D, et cetera, I want to make sure that when I aggregate or put all that data together, that we have consistency in how we measured inebriation or inappropriate behavior or foolish behavior, et cetera. So what do we do? Well, the way that we do this is we do this approach called inter-rater reliability. And what we do is I would have the same four people go out in sort of a test moment, maybe send them all to the same conference and then have them observe the exact same group of individuals have them record their observations, and then they bring them back to me and I check the correlation between the raters. And the way this works is I'm looking, are they all sort of seeing the same thing? Are they counting the same number of inappropriate behavior or people acting foolish or inebriated or drunk or whatever? Um, and that's sort of this notion of inter-rater reliability. Um, we see this often whenever you're in a situation and oftentimes this takes training where the researchers need to be properly trained because sometimes if my six research assistants come back to me and one of them is just his or her scores are just completely different than anyone else, I may have to get rid of that person, right? Say, mm, I need a different research assistant. If the other, the other five uh, research assistants are coming back with roughly the same scores, then what I do is I train them. I say, okay, let's go back and look at what you observed and let's make sort of a list, a guideline of let's have a checklist so that we all are on the same page as far as understanding what it is we're looking for. What is sort of the, you know, inappropriate behavior? What's the level of inebriation that we're looking for? What, whatever it may be. Um, and so the idea of this is there's ways to always fix it. I mean, with all these whether it was one of the earlier ones with survey research, you can get rid of certain bad questions or add more questions. Um, you can tweak the, the questions. With inner rater reliability, when you're having people observe um, human behavior, one of the things you can do is train your research assistants to make sure that they're all looking for the exact same things, that you almost have like a guideline of saying, you only count, you know, you only, put a check mark for this behavior when you see X, Y, or Z behavior occur and sort of have that sort of objectifying of what even what is a subjective thing. And I know that's kind of sounds like a contradiction, but that's kind of what we're doing as researchers. So the problem, the main problem with this one is what is known as chance agreement. Sometimes people may just guess and it may appear that they are being consistent in how they're measuring something, but it wasn't because they really thought they saw it. They were just kind of just guessing. Um, and I'm not going to go into much more detail on that, but there is a way to work with that because there's some, there's a reliability coefficient called the Kappa coefficient in statistics that is actually rather effective at adjusting or controlling for the likelihood of chance agreement when you're doing subjective, um, uh, observations. All right. So those are the four types of reliability measures. Let's move on. So how do I improve reliability? Well, first and foremost, I can, if I've, as I've mentioned a couple times, if I'm realizing that I've got a couple questions on my survey that just do not show consistency with the other questions or just don't seem to be getting at what I want, get rid of them and get better questions, period. Um, a second one, although not quite as good because we'll talk about this later in the class, 
is the idea of, of adding more items. Sometimes like if rather than asking, as I started with my example where I said, I could ask eight questions about cold heartedness, um, I could improve it by adding two or three more questions to measure your level of cold heartedness. The problem with that is nobody likes a very long survey. So you're trying to be, remember we, you may recall when we talked about parsimony with theory, simple is better but it's gotta be good. So you gotta find that balance between effective yet simple. So, but adding more items with reliability does tend to improve the reliability because the random errors, the overestimates, the underestimates tend to cancel out. And then arguably one of the key things is standardize what you're doing. If you want consistency, you need to standardize your data collection, period. Right, the questions should always be phrased the same way from one group of subjects to another. If you have uh, subjective observations, you need to train your research assistants. Make sure they know exactly what they're looking for, right? And I think the best example of that inner rater stuff is think about people who are umpires in baseball or referees in football um, or officials in, 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 in basketball, right? Um, now, we all make jokes that, that they are not consistent, but that's kind of a good example of reliability. But they go through a lot of training to try to look for, in very fast-paced sports, looking for minor fouls and infractions. And the better trained they are, the more likely they are to keep their job. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with research assistants. Um, also, we standardize the format and the setting, right? If you gave one group of, of research subjects uh, paper and pencil surveys, you, maybe you should keep it the same way for other ones as opposed to having some of them done on a computer, um, some done on paper and pencil, some done verbally, because all those things can affect the reliability or the consistency and the timing of occasions, right? If, if we're trying to measure and looking for consistency, depending upon what constructs we're measuring, people are different. People are different even throughout the single day. Right. If you have some group of individuals coming in at 7 a.m. to fill out a survey and another group coming in at 2 p.m. and another group coming in at 5 p.m., I imagine even for yourself, we're all a little different throughout the day. Some of us wake up happy and then kind of slow down as the day goes on. Some of us wake up grumpy and then kind of hit our stride and then start to slow down in the evening. Others of us, it doesn't take it takes until three or four in the afternoon before we're even awake. And then we go all night, right? So even the timing of data collection can have an influence on reliability or consistency. All right, as we wrap up with this one, just to sort of remind you, because some of the terminology that I use in this lecture is, is slightly different than some of the terminology used in your book. Um, one of the things, I love this textbook, but one of the things that I draw back is I think they do not do a good job of going into great deal about reliability. Um, so do your best to sort of understand the concepts that I've put out here. What you see on this slide is sort of where the, the terminologies and the various, the four different types of reliability analysis sort of correspond to the, the, the um, terminology and, the, and what they refer to in the course textbook. So we'll wrap it up with that for reliability. Uh, thank you for being patient. I know this was a long one and then look forward for the next measurement theory one, which will go into validity. So take care.